Hello and welcome to our talk on entrepreneurial adventures, which I'm going to put into presentation mode right now. So starting your own company, we're going to cover all of it that we can within the 55 minutes we're allotted. Um, an entrepreneur is someone who will jump off a cliff and then assemble an airplane on the way down. Uh, and that is absolutely how it feels. So, whoops, there we go. So who am I? I'm Unicorn. Um, I've started several companies as well as a nonprofit. Um, and I'm also at the think tank as a senior fellow at the R Street Institute. Who am I? Keenan Skelly. I'm the CEO of Shifted, which is a technology company and also the CEO of a solutions company or a consulting company, um, Spark Security Solutions. And back in the day, when I first got out of the military, I also owned a company called Ascendiary Pathfinding, which uh, helped soldiers find uh, jobs once they uh, started transitioning. So in the chat, um, please throw in your questions and we can't see them while we're presenting. Um, but if we have time at the end, we are happy to get to them. And um, otherwise, uh, there will be lots of resources and ways to reach out with us and we'll be sharing these slides. So please feel free to follow up with either one of us um, for any questions you have. So this, uh, we didn't update this, this should actually be us. And we're not, uh, we're not lawyers. This is not legal advice. And we're not even the best entrepreneurs out there. Well, Keenan might be, but I'm definitely not. So why do you want to do this to yourself? The first point is it's not going to be just about you. This journey involves your significant other, your family, your relatives, your friends. They are all going to be a part of this journey with you. Keenan, do you remember that, that first time you, you hit the initial enthusiasm to the drop? Oh my gosh, I'm pretty sure that was just three weeks ago. <laughs> so everything was so beautiful and all of the investors were coming and the idea was magical. And then suddenly there's funding out there and you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Now I actually have to make this happen with with four people. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it wasn't that long ago. And I think every, uh, every CEO, every entrepreneur experiences it at a different level. Sometimes you get it right away and sometimes it takes a little bit of time. So I like to call this beginning part. This is the honeymoon phase. You get in there and everything is just rainbows and unicorns as far as the eye can see. And then like Keenan said, then the money part. What are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Because it turns out whatever you thought at that beginning, that idea changes. And we'll talk about how and why. And how you really make money so that you sort of get the escape momentum is that next whole part of figuring out, hey, I had a great idea. Several other people around me think it's a great idea, but what are all the different kinds of people that are out there who would want to pay and how much would they want to pay for this? So to be an entrepreneur requires two skills. One, passion. Keenan, do you want to say number two? Tolerance for bullshit, babies. I mean, oh my gosh, it's every day. It's all the time. It's everywhere. And I would add actually a third one to that, uh, and that's resilience. You're gonna get knocked down a lot. You're gonna have a lot of people reject you and tell you that you're crazy and your idea is horrible and what were you thinking? Um, so you just gotta be resilient and say, no, it's a good idea and I believe it is. So there are two that are intentionally not on here. One is smarts. You don't have to be smart. You just have to have an idea that you're willing to hold on to like that bulldog. And two is not money. Money helps you accomplish those things, but that's not the reason to do it. And when Keenan was talking about, you know, that feeling of why resilience is important, to me, that's why passion is critical because you should have an idea that means so much to you that it is painful that it is not out there in the world because that's what's gonna keep you going when you wake up that morning and you're just like, oh, I work at my own job. I don't wanna <laughs> do this. It's that passion that's going to keep you going with that. So, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. So you've got an idea. Step one, talk to people. Step two, talk to more people. Step three, have those people introduce you to other people to go and talk to them. 
And by talk, we mean listen. So why would anybody pay you for what your idea is? This is super important. It's it's super it's great. Uh, and I, I'm a big thinker. Like I sit up at night and I'm like, oh, you know, it'd be really cool as if this happened. But all of those great ideas don't really mean anything unless I can convince other people to pay for it. So you need to be, as an entrepreneur, your own devil's advocate. You need to sharpshoot yourself every possible way. You need to know all the other people who have thought of this idea and succeeded. because Those people might be your competition in the future. Or all of the people who tried this idea and failed because you're going to learn lessons from those failures. So know, know what you're doing in terms of the business, the market side of it because passion is great but understanding how people are going to buy it and if people are going to buy it is also super important so one of the hardest parts to start with is that when you have an idea it's really easy to want to keep that idea to yourself for lots of reasons right one is is fear that maybe i'm not my idea is not as good as i think it is and it's hard to get that tough you know that that really strong medicine that says yeah um, you know, maybe like this or maybe like that. And that can be that can be difficult. Um, rejection is a part, which is why why Keenan said resilience. Rejection is a continual part of being an entrepreneur. I have had thousands of times more people say no to me than I have had say yes. And they do it for all different reasons. They have their own pieces. But it's important to have had those conversations. So I understand more of that. The other part is people are afraid, oh, they're going to steal my idea. Most of the time, it's not the idea itself. It's you, the potential entrepreneur, and that team that you can build around yourself. That's what's going to be what propels you into the uncertainty and makes an idea happen more than it is the idea itself. And we're going to talk a little bit more um, later in the presentation about, you know, the investor process. But I can tell you hands down that every investor that I've talked to they like the idea. They love, you know, where we're going with it. But the entire first conversation is about who I am, who the team is, and where we came from. So it's all about: Do you have the ability to make this succeed? Are you the kind of people? Are you the dreamers? Are you the doers? Are you the the rock star team that's going to make this happen no matter what? So our Pearl first pearl of wisdom. wisdom. Sorry. <laughs> Pearls of wisdom. So throughout the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about some of my favorite um, startup CEOs who are just doing crazy, amazing things. And our first one is uh, from Caitlin Bowden. She says, listen to people who know the things that you don't know and learn to accept help and guidance. That's so important. Surrounding yourself with a brilliant team makes everything easier. Now you can check uh, Caitlin out on uh, Twitter at Badass Bowden. And uh, I highly recommend that. She's really amazing. So just a reminder, we are going to share these slides. All of the links, all of the handles, everything you could want will be available because you'll notice that we put links to everything where we get it from somewhere else. And there's some places where somebody else said it better than us. And we highly recommend that you go check those out. So products versus services. This is the question of, all right, I have this idea. How do I monetize it? There are fundamentally two models to monetize. Either it's a service or it's a product. Services, one hour of work equals one hour of pay. Products, one hour of effort can be whatever anybody wants to pay, what anybody is willing to pay. That is the market proposition. And this is important because this is going to come in later with our understanding of what are the economics of our business, as well as whether or not we want to consider raising money. Um, I feel like our slides got off because this shouldn't be here. We're like jumped ahead or something. I'm sure it's my fault. I like to go in and mess everything up. Oh, I stopped sharing. Hold on a second. Technical difficulties. <sighs> While he's talking about that or dealing with that issue, you know, um, for me, becoming an entrepreneur, uh, it's something that I've always wanted to do, like ever since I was younger. And sometimes you don't necessarily know that. Sometimes you don't know that until you have an idea or a product that just really makes you stand up and say, this should be a thing. This should be a thing that other people can experience. And I think um, everybody that I know who's an entrepreneur or CEO has gone through that kind of that phase where 
maybe you thought it was a good idea, but you, then you found the perfect product or you found the perfect idea and you were able to launch that. Okay, so we're back. Some slides got a little bit out of order. Um, so this is the part, okay. So Keenan, you're a solo founder at Shifted, correct? Correct. Um, however, my first company, I was not a solo founder. So I've seen kind of both ways that that this can go. And, you know, you have a lot of things outlined here, but it's difficult when you come in with your BFFs, when you come in with the people that you've grown up with, that you love, because business can go a couple of different ways. And not understanding roles and expectations and who's going to do what is, is absolutely critical when you're coming with your BFF. Because you don't know, um, in my first experience, I, I, I ended up doing a lot of the work. <laughs> um, and it's interesting how that plays out in terms of leadership, in terms of you know uh, equity, in terms of those types of things. Yeah, so one of the things that I've heard as a solo founder is, we really like to see the founders to be split evenly where there's somebody who's good at the business and there's somebody that's good at the tech. Um, and I will tell you that being a founder on your own is very lonely. There's, there's nobody else to bitch to about the business. Uh, there's nobody to bitch about the, the very specific things that you're doing. I mean, all of your folks are doing their own stuff. Um, and so it's, it's very comfortable and it's very common for folks to go to their friends to look for co-founders. And of course, friendship and business don't always go together. And so the key really is setting up those expectations. And one of the big things that a lot of mistakes that a lot of folks make is they assign equity on day one. Oh, we're both partners. We should both get 50-50. And then a year later, you found out, you know, you find out that after a year, things have changed. Um, you know, something happened in somebody's life, wh whatever that is that 50-50 split no longer feels fair. And so one of the best pieces of advice I can give is, why not wait? Get the business off. Don't worry about the equity. Have it written down. I mean, you want to have this, <laughs> have it documented, have it legal, but have a point where you're going to assess and agree to that in the future. And if possible, maybe you can establish some metrics. Maybe there is different expectations in that conversation that comes out of what does success look like? Pearls of wisdom of oh, one of my favorite people. Uh, so Alyssa Miller, she says, write down your vision and your mission early. Why are you launching this business and how do you plan to achieve your goals? Then anytime you encounter a really tough decision or business decision and you just can't decide, look back to your vision and your mission and choose the option that helps to accomplish those. So I think this is super important. And I know I've, I've had to do this a lot of times. It's really easy when you start a business and you start to figure out that everybody idea or everybody else has ideas about what your use case should be or what your product should be. Um, and some of those are great and great to learn from, but if they don't fall into what your vision of the company is or what your um, overall goal of the company is, then you have to really consider that because sometimes you could start with an idea that really made sense and really changed the world. And you know that's what we all wanna do. Um, but then you kind of guided off of that path into a direction that other people think that you should go. So check in with yourself, give yourself a gut check every once in a while. This is also a great way to come to a common understanding and to revisit it whenever you are with um, co-founders. Absolutely. So incorporate, okay. So the purpose of incorporation is to establish a legal structure and they're in the United States are primarily three kinds, the limited liability corporation, an S corporation and a C corporation. And these are good because they provide a way that you've now established this activity is not you. Without this, it's you performing the work directly and that leaves you open to all sorts of potential liability directly. Whereas this, you've established a corporate shell to protect yourself. First up, check name availability. You've got a great name. Turns out 500 other people also had that name too. Um, one of the other ways to get around that is that you can come up with a legal name that's different than as your trade name, which is the doing business as name. So for example, um, my company Grimm, our 
legal name is SMFS Inc. And then we do business as Grimm. So we, um, for Shifted, you know, we looked at, um, we had a very specific company name that we really, everybody loved. In fact, the, the designers already started making art for it. Like we were just totally down with it. And in our inis initial search, we found, I don't know, a couple of companies, but none of them were doing what we were doing. They were all doing very random things. And then one day, somebody on the team sent a link to everybody and we found a company literally with the same name doing exactly what we do <laughs> and everybody was just devastated and it's horrifying so when you're going through that process find the name before you start the work on the marketing materials i think that's really crucial <laughs> yeah the the funniest uh, collision i've ever had was uh, for a website um certainly um this was eight years ago grim.com was was taken in the 90s because it's such a common name um, and we started looking at different permutations and we found a conflict with one of the ones we wanted with a hairdresser in South Africa. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That is 100% okay, true. Okay, who, <laughs> who names their hairdressing salon Grim? Well, I don't um, know if I would get my hair done there. <laughs> what? They just take a little off the top. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's a common last name. So that was that's the conflict. Uh, next up uh, is going to the IRS and getting your employee ID number, just like you have a social security number as an American citizen. Uh, you also have an employee identification number because uh, that's how the IRS uh, tracks you. Uh, at the state level, you're gonna register in each state that you do business in. Um, the clever states are um, most, if you look, you'll see most companies are incorporated in Delaware, and that is because they are the, the gold standard for um, efficiency and ease of business law. Um, two other ones that are also clever for different reasons are Nevada and Wyoming. And then, of course, make sure that you are compliant with uh, your local county, township, city um, as well. And of course, the U.S. government. Um, if you want to do business with the U.S. government, you're going to have to get a cage code. You should probably get a Dunn's number through Dunn's and uh, Dunn and Bradstreet. Um, as some of, uh, in fact, most of the people I know when they first start a business, unless they're catering entirely to the government, don't think about this. But uh, what's re really interesting about this is that there are um, multiple government agencies. So no matter what your business is, whether you know it's something that Health and Human Services could use or something that DHS could use or something that uh, Department of Defense could use, these kinds of things are important so that you can get into that community. They are free. In the case of the SAM one, I'm not gonna say it's easy. They do overwhelm you with bureaucrat garbage. Um, Dun & Bradstreet is simple, um, but it's free. Once you do it, you're good. You never have to worry about it again. And then as we cover later in this presentation, it also opens you up to opportunities for free money. And who doesn't like free money? Special designations. So yeah, it's super cool that you bought your domain. Things are getting really great now. Um, you've incorporated, woo. But special designations are really important and not enough people think of, you know, what they can do with these. So a couple of the types of uh, special designations, veteran, disabled veteran, woman, minority, economically advantaged. Um, people refer to some of these as, you know, if you have more than one, you're kind of like a unicorn in the world of the government or even the world of large, uh, larger corporations and larger businesses who offer special kind of priorities for people who fit into this category. Now, um, one of them that I highly suggest that, uh, that anybody who's a, um, a startup uh, entrepreneur look at is definitely economically advantaged. You can go to the Small Business Administration and identify what the qualifications are for that, along with all of these other uh, qualifications as well. But uh, I definitely want to highlight that it's not just uh, the government where these are important. There are a lot of companies out there like Microsoft and AWS who have special considerations for veterans, for women, for minorities all of those things. And in addition to that, you can do this both in your state of operation and you can do it with the federal government. So each of those offers opportunities, like I said, for special designations, but also um, for additional grant funding and money. And again, who doesn't like free money? To raise 
Well, not to raise. So we covered earlier about um, whether services or products, um, and we actually did that a little bit out of order, which should be right before this one. Um, but this is going to dictate the whether or not to go get money from somebody else. Um, because all too often, there's just this prevailing understanding, I should go raise money. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, if you're doing a services monetized company for your idea, the answer is no, probably. And the reason for that is like we talked, is that one hour of effort equals one hour of pay. And if pay is $1,000 an hour, it still only scales with, with the folks that you have. And that's not something that a typical uh, investor is going to be interested in. It's not that there aren't investors that are like that, but on average, there's not the same potential for return that gets them interested in. And then products, products are traditionally what you're looking at for raising. And there's lots of reasons to do that and we'll cover it. But the, the short piece here is just understanding that based solely on your company type is primarily gonna dictate your consideration. So here is an example of where somebody says it way better than me. Haroon Mir, thinks Canary. There's the link to the video. Highly recommend you check it out. It's called Bootstrapping Ego. He goes into entire detail on the, con so it's a, it's a deep dive on control versus growth. When you raise, you're bringing somebody else inside your machinery. And there's this balance of how much control do you and your leadership team want or need to have over the idea at what phases versus where you really need to go with velocity at the market and investing in that growth. There's also, um, for those of you who are interested, we're gonna talk about pitching and things of that nature now. There's a couple of great podcasts out there called The Pitch um, and some others that I can drop here into the chat that really walk you through the process of what those conversations mean. Like, um, you know, when they say they want 20% of this or they're gonna give you a convertible note or et cetera, knowing what those terminology um, items kind of are and knowing what they're gonna take from you during the process is super important. So Google it, go to the podcast. Um, there's a lot of great resources for that. And we'll cover, we'll cover some of that in, in the presentation um, with um, considerations of equity, um, but certainly not to the depth that she's talking about. And those podcasts are fantastic. So types of investors, what kinds of uh, investors have you seen, Keenan? <laughs> I've seen lots of them and uh, they're all super interesting. And um, we're going to talk about this a little bit later too. Not all of them are right for you. <laughs> so, so take the time to learn about what each of these are. Google is your friend in this case. Um, understanding the kind of pitfalls of maybe having friends and family help. Uh, the pitfalls of maybe getting into incubators. Um, I find this a lot, uh, and I know he's going to talk a little bit more about some of these, but with incubators in particular, a lot of people who are starting a business have a great um, acumen for business, have already been in business for a while before they come into it. So incubators, for example, um, will offer to bring you to a location and they will say, we are going to teach you how to do business or we're going to teach you how to do, you know, uh, how to make your business succeed. But some entrepreneurs entrepreneurs already know that. So you kind of have to know yourself and your team and understand what the value of incubators and those types of opportunities actually are for you. The other reason it's important to know the different types of investors is when you start putting out into your vibe into the universe that you're going to raise, people are going to come out of the woodwork. And most of them are going to be 23. <laughs> and a, a an associate associate at some place and they're going to they're going to want 30 to 60 minutes of your time and the most valuable resource you have as an entrepreneur is time when i started off on my first raise i would say probably 80 to 90% of the meetings i had for a while i could have if i had known what i was doing i could have avoided those meetings they were absolutely non starters from the start but i didn't know that and the reason is that when you are um, most of it, so if we're talking about starting a company, right, we're talking about seed level funding. 
there are only a few kinds of VCs that are actually going to be at that stage because that's considered the riskiest stage. This is I'm going to be throwing anywhere from, um, you know, $50,000 to maybe a couple few million dollars to a company that has no proof that this is going to go anywhere. You see a lot more investment in the later stages like B, C and D, where that's where you see the big the big money that comes into it. There are lots of companies with lots of money focused on the, hey, this idea has already proven at this point. I just want to jump in and get a share of that at the end. So knowing that in advance, that's a question you can ask. Do you invest in seed companies? And I guarantee you, most of them will honestly tell you, no, we don't. And then they still want to talk to you. Well, we want to establish a relationship with you. That point, it's your choice. I will tell you the answer should also still be no. Because again, <laughs> time being so valuable, you speaking with somebody that hypothetically in two to three to four years might be valuable um, at that stage is probably not worth it. Um, the I other would thing say you also yeah. need to interrogate these guys, right? Like you said, you had some of them who were, um, you know, just not the right fit and really you shouldn't have been spending your time on that. I find uh, that kind of uh, using your investor meetings very much like interviews is important. You need to know exactly what you're looking for. And um, sometimes you don't, sometimes you go into that first meeting and they ask you and they're like, okay, so how much money do you want? And what's it going to look like? And what are the percentages? And you're like, is he, is speaking English? <laughs> what did all of that mean? Um, so it's really, it's hard to figure that process out. But if you do just a little bit of research in advance, if you check out, there's some great websites out there that talk about each stage um, and what you should be looking for and what you can be looking for, then you know the right questions to ask when you're talking to these investors. And so while they're not an investor, I threw it down here because this is free money to help bootstrap. The SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation Program, is free money. So it comes in three different phases. Uh, typically, phase uh, phase one is about fifty thousand uh, dollars. Phase two is um, one hundred fifty and up, and then phase three is commercialization and release, and that can be anywhere shy of a million dollars. So that's free money where the government is saying, "Hey, we think there's something that could be interesting in here. We want to help you get the idea going." So. Again, this goes back to if you have a DUNS and a CAGE code, you're able to freely participate in this program trying to get money to match requirements that the government sees. All right. So you're <laughs> going to raise, after all, the pitch deck. So this is taken from um, Ron Gula. And in short, there are five core elements to a pitch deck. In one slide, what is the problem? And it is really key to put this in a fundamentally one slide because this is the uh, the start of the elevator pitch. This is this answers the why. This is the what. This is all of that up front because I, I'm sure you've all heard the cliche. They don't have the attention span to get past that. It is so true. They don't have the attention span to get past that. <laughs> This Next, is the hook. This is <laughs> the if, hook. If they don't get the hook, like they're, it's not coming in. You're not reeling them in. And the hook needs to be tight because you're going to be talking to folks that don't know your space. Certainly, they don't know the space as well as you do, right? You're the one who has this idea. You're the one who sees this innovation and this possibility. That hook is your ability to translate that to somebody who's not an expert. Second, the how. What is your solution? Now, you can do this in more than one slide, but be able to tightly explain your solution and how it meets the what? Proof. Do you have proof? Even if you don't have paying customers, surely you can, well, not surely, but it helps to go and find folks who are willing to try your stuff out for free, right? I mean, this is not the, the artistic, hey, you're doing this for exposure. This is, you are, you have a beta idea. It's not ready for prime time. And it's not at the point that anybody would pay money for it. Having somebody willing to just play with it, though, and give you that feedback, that's a strong signal at this stage. And just Funding. a side note on that, you know, sometimes you are, sometimes your product is a little bit further along, um, maybe paid POCs. So don't jump right into customers. But if you're a little bit more mature, then you can start doing paid POCs and still get that kind of um, affirmation of the product. 
Yeah, anybody who can say, I've seen it, I've touched it, I'd be willing to buy this someday is worth something. Funding. Keenan, you've been well into the funding cycle right now. All the good times. How much do you want and what are you going to do with it? That sounds really harrowing when, when you first hear it. You're like, what do you mean? How much do I want? I want all the money. <laughs> Obviously, I want $40 million and I'm going to build the best company ever with it. But that's not realistic and it's not actually going to be effective for you. So what you need to do is dial down into a time boxed area for the next eight months, I need this, 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 and this. I need these two engineers, I need this sales pod, and I need a marketer, one marketer, to make this magic for the next eight months. And then outline exactly what those critical moments are for each of those uh, eight months. We're gonna have this delivered to this potential customer. We're going to have this completed so that this potential customer can you know, uh, come into the product once it's finished. Being able to tie that timeline and the actual outcomes of the how the money is being spent to acquire customers is absolutely critical. And so for me, that that first part of how much money was um, kind of funny because you get so focused on, I need to sell the what, I need to make the hook, I need to get them interested. And then I was kind of like, oh yeah, but I'm doing that so you, like I have a number to ask for. <laughs> and it, it took me a while to figure that out. And then the, the final piece here, which I put in an asterisk, um, is your team. Like Keenan said earlier, the you is most of what's going to make this sale. All of those parts are what the VCs are looking for to be able to understand the idea. Half of it is you being able to sell why you, why your team, and how you're going to adjust. Because everybody reasonably knows that what you have today on that pitch deck is a snapshot in time. And I want to understand, are you capable of adjusting to whatever that reality is? Whether that reality is a normal environment where your product turns out to have different customers or different view than you thought, or let's look at 2020, which has been just a raging dumpster fire that nobody predicted. How do you adjust to that as an entrepreneur? Absolutely. I think the other part of that also is um, they really want to see that you've thought about it, right? They want to see that you've thought about the problem, that you've really thought about the solution, that you've thought about who's going to buy it, uh, and some of these other really you know, complicated concepts. And uh, the fact is that a lot of entrepreneurs come into the situation, come into a pitch without any of these ideas. So if you can nail these five key points and demonstrate that you've thought this process through, you're doing pretty good. You're ahead of the herd. Oh, goodness. It never ends. Ever, 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 ever. I found this GIF on the internet and I almost cried because it's so true. You will talk to companies, you will talk to BC and equity and they'll say, wow, this is really fascinating and we're super interested and um, we'll call you back in six months and see where you guys are at. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> we went through three weeks of time. So part of this goes back to your time management, but part of it also goes back to your ability to know your pitch inside and out because it never ends. You will get phone calls on planes, literally on planes, and somebody will say, we need you to talk to this investor and tell them the pitch. And you're like, I'm on a plane. And they're like, and? <laughs> you need to be ready to do this in your sleep. You need to be ready to do this to random people that you meet on the street. It's not just your 30 second elevator pitch. It's you selling this brilliant strategy and vision that you have and how you can make it happen to literally anybody that you meet ever, 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 ever. It's well above and beyond that 30 second pitch. It's you pitching your future, your life, the future of the company, the future of your technology. And if you don't do it in your sleep, if you aren't so familiar with this pitch that you can just blah, anytime, you got to get better at that. You got to work on that. How many pitches have you given, Keenan? <laughs> uh, this year, probably 100. And I would say more than half of those were not relevant at all. A lot of them were, <laughs> but a lot of them were not. So. Yeah, over my time, I've probably given um, 150. Um, but the the number that I always have in my head is it was probably about a thousand meetings. Oh um, yeah. When I oh, well, not like pitches. This isn't even around the pitch. This is I was just talking to people about my idea, our idea, the idea, and 
it was probably, it took probably a thousand meetings before I could effectively explain the idea. I would go and I'd pitch potential customers and I would talk to different influencers and I would talk to different folks. And it was some number of meetings before, like it was because they were frustrating in the beginning because it turns out you can know engineering wise what you have. That's not the same thing as the value proposition of what you have. Another interesting point here is finding the investors that do what you do. Because there's a lot of investors out there and you can just start, you know, throwing darts out there and, and hope you hit a center target. But, you know, go to Crunchbase, go uh, go to the Internet, figure out who the investors are in your space <laughs> so that you don't waste a lot of time with other investors who primarily invest in food companies or spandex or <laughs> things of these natures, because those those are not going to help you. And it's just going to take away from your time. Oh, no, this one's all you. <laughs> okay, let's have the cishet white male founder. Um, so <laughs> this is a, this is a pearl of wisdom that came out um, from a good friend of mine, Katie Maseris, um, when I put this presentation together for the first time a few months ago. She came back and said, everything cishet white male founders tell you probably will not work if you're not in that group. And this very much captures one of the problems in our industry as well as in the equity world. They're insular communities. There is a valley bias. Um, I can tell you as somebody who lives on the East Coast, I've had numerous investors. First question they ask is like, all right, we like this idea. Are you moving to the valley? No. Yeah, we're done. And can I can cover. tell you as a woman, um, a very, very, and I, actually I'm, I'm thinking, I honestly can't think of a single one of these investor meetings that I've been in where there was another woman in the call. So there are challenges with that. There are challenges, there are questions that you're gonna get asked that may seem totally irrelevant um, simply because there's not a lot of representation of women or minorities or others in this group of the investor community. Although that's changing, I will say that. How many tech bros have you met? Oh gosh, <laughs> all the tech bros. Bruh, bruh. And what is that like? It's not cool. Um, it's it's unfortunate. And um, in my mind, so your meaning of tech bro might be a little bit different than mine, but my meaning of tech bro is, hey, um, you don't have enough experience and technology and you didn't spend enough hardcore time you know, coding to be able to understand this concept well enough. And they're like, but we know everyone in the tech community. We know everyone. We know the guy who built the internet, okay? Like personally. And you know, you're just not there. To me, that's a tech bro, <laughs> but your definition might be different. Oh no, that's exactly what I was putting down there. Oh good. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what the challenge is, is this community makes decisions based on relationships. And it's difficult, right? If you don't fit the archetype they have in their mind, which a lot of it, of course, is the cishet white male, it's really hard to crack that crust to get full access to, to raising. And it's important to recognize that this is what we face. It's not fair, no. but it's better to know what it is. I would say, though, there are a lot of great firms that are coming out with, um, you know, wonderful uh, diversity and wonderful women who are leading VC companies. And if you if you want to go after those, you can find them very easily on Google. I mean, um, and just email them or call them and say, hey, I'm I'm uh, this minority. I'm a woman or I'm uh, this kind of diverse group. And I'm really interested in learning more about what you have. And nine times out of 10, they're going to take your call and they're going to listen because that's exactly what they're there for. And that's one of the other reasons we highlight multiple female founders is the founder community is your best friend. So these are resources to help you find those appropriate investors to find those folks who are going to help. Absolutely. Hey, okay. finding your people. Your people, find your people in this world because a lot of times, not a lot of times, I would say sometimes, 
you have such a great idea that everybody wants to throw money at you. You get money and you get money and you get money. Okay, but that doesn't mean that that's money that you necessarily want to take, right? So not every investment firm is the right firm for you. Take consideration, do 30 minutes of research of them, you know, on Crunchbase or on Google or talk to other founders and find out what they, you know, what their experience was. Because, you know, I think Bryson said this in his, his last talk that kind of covered this is this is a marriage. You are getting involved with these people for a very, very long time. And if they don't share your beliefs, if they don't share your ideals, if they don't share your understanding of what the business should be, then it's not the right fit for you. And you don't don't want to be in that relationship for 10 years. You don't want to be in that relationship through your seed round, your A round, your B round, because that is a lot of headaches uh, with somebody that you don't necessarily agree with. It's okay. And this is, this is really hard to grasp. Like this is, <laughs> this is so hard. <laughs> it is okay to turn down money from investors or investment firms that you do not fundamentally agree with. It's okay. I'd say that even broader. It's okay to turn down money from anybody. You're going to have customers who try to bully you and try to shift you away from your vision. And like Keenan talked about earlier in the presentation, yeah. write that down. When we quote, you know, it was, it was Alyssa's Pearl of Wisdom. Write that down. Revisit it. Don't forget it because you're going to find so many distractions and so many opportunities to chase. Investors are going to try to drive you to a, one market or the other. Large customers are going to dangle large checks for you to try to go one way or the other. Yes. Stay true to what your vision is. It's okay to turn down the money that might shift you from that. Yep. Addressable market. So there are different kinds of customers. Understanding who those customers are, what makes them their different colored unicorn in this case, and what is the deal value on average for those different kinds of customers? So this is a question that a lot of people get stymied on because VCs want to know what's the addressable market. Hey, you've got a new idea. That's cool. That sounds risky. How much potential money is there to be made? A lot of folks will be very broad with the answer here. Like, well, red teaming is a $2 billion market. Therefore, I think I can get 10% of it. Okay, how, how, right. what does that look like? <laughs> right, yeah, you get you. That's exactly the response. They're going to be like, "Yeah, try again." Um, and Andrew Morris joked a couple of months ago from he's from uh, uh, Gray Noise Intelligence, um, and he was just saying, "You know what? I forget my addressable market the second I walk out of the VC meeting." And there's truth to that too. The reality is, this is important in as much that yeah, it's kind of an exercise. It shows your thinking and your understanding of who does your product appeal to, how can you segment those markets, and then what are those markets worth? Your thinking and, is what's being measured. And it should really change over time as you understand your market better, as you understand who's buying this, who wants to buy this, that should totally change. So economics. What does an employee cost? So this is a flip side of the addressable market is what our potential customers represent. Economics is the internal of an employee does not just cost their salary. So salary is the baseline. And then on top of that, we're going to pack additional things. Fringe, what's fringe? Fringe includes benefits, health insurance, pay time off, 401k, Free M and M's, IT Whatever. packages, the T-shirts, and the coffee cups. General and administrative is then specific things around a particular project. That's going to be more important when you're looking at um, a services consulting type organization versus product. And then overhead is okay. This is the back office. This is what everything costs. This is what um, if you're a CEO. This is you know administrative staff. Um, this is an office. Remember when we had offices? I don't remember what they look like. It's an alien concept. I'm cool with that though. But this is good for two reasons. One, this is good to understand because again, you can kind of have in your, he your head, this is the multiple of what somebody costs. 
So a general range of a cost of a person is going to be anywhere from a very lean organization, which is going to be about a 1.3 multiple on top of hourly salary to a very expensive organization, which could be up to 2.5. It's good to have that number in your head for two reasons. One, you can quickly understand what it costs to bring somebody in from a planning figure accurately. The other reason is it's really good from a budgeting perspective. It's a good way to say, all right, this is what I expect to spend on these things this year because they're kind of invisible costs until you realize them. They're not as simple as, well, I'm going to go buy a computer and that's $1,500 that I need to plan for in October. This is when an employee comes on, these are all the costs that are going to be associated with them and they don't hit immediately. They kind of sneak up back on you. So it's really good to, to understand the internal economics. I would actually really recommend uh, whether you have a SaaS business or not to go uh, to the internet and Google, you know, SaaS financial model uh, and just start looking at the things that are in there and trying to understand all of the things that are going to come up that you didn't think about before. Uh, internet hosting cost, um, you know, back end infrastructure cost, um, marketing cost, you know, uh, pay per click cost. And even though in your first six months or your first eight months, those things may be irrelevant as you start Start to grow, then those things become really important. And being able to think about that very strategically from a business perspective demonstrates to investors, demonstrates to your customers that you really understand your business. So we're going to fly through this back end here because this is a lot of the logistics. Um, and we also want to give some time for Q&A. Um, all right. So now we're looking at hiring. Our business is up and going. At some point, we're going to reach that we need other people to be a part of this. Well, let's start with the beginning, the reference model. You know people, right? Start with friends. Um, start growing from there. Um, that helps because those are going to be people that generally have a common vision and values with you. There is a risk, of course, with hiring friends that you are hiring friends. But friends can also make recommendations. Like then going back to ask people, ask them to introduce you to other people. Your friends are going to know people and you're going to turn out that you have your own little indeed or monster.com around you of a lot more people than you realize. The, the problem with rank is that when you're very young, it's very easy to assign somebody a very senior rank. Chances are that the grand admiral senior vice executive president of customer <laughs> success is most likely not going to still be that role when you grow to 500 people. And it's going to be very awkward when somebody has that rank after five years and you need to bring in somebody who's actually had the experience to help take your company to the next level. Incentive. Uh, there are different ways to incentivize. Um, the thing about equity is I believe that you want everybody to have some level of being personally invested in your company. Not everybody believes that. And on the flip side, just because you showed up to work and you get great salary and great benefits doesn't mean you're entitled to a significant piece of that company. Equity really wants to be tied to the folks that have either really put blood and sweat and something in it or represent a significant value proposition to where the company can go. Um, an even safer option to do that is, in fact, options. Options are where we're going to give you basically paper conversion to equity. So this is good because it's not a taxable event. Um, equity is worth something and that has to be taxed. Options are saying, hey, whenever there is a transactional event in the future, either the company is bought or somebody decides to convert those, it's not taxed until that moment. And then finally, the last piece, of course, is the straight cash bonus. Um, I generally, for a product company, Bonuses are not something that you're going to be actually that interested in the beginning because you're trying to get something off the ground. Cash is your lifeblood and giving bonuses can be difficult to trying to get that thing going because at the end of the day, you want all of the money to be going back into the idea because everybody that's working there is fundamentally trying to get that idea to take flight. And you have to have a growth mindset and you want people in your organization who all also have a growth mindset, who maybe don't need those bonuses right now or don't want them, 
but uh, they know that they have options or they know that they have a little bit of equity. So those things kind of balance out and you have to figure out there's there's standards for you know different roles and responsibilities and what should be given and what shouldn't be given. But at the end of the day, it's your choice to who is really driving this company and who's really in it and how you want to reward them. Oh, pearls of wisdom. One of my favorite, favorite people, Kate King. Don't be afraid to be original. Great companies are born out of original ideas and the innovative experiences created by collected greatness. So all of the things that you've experienced in your life, the good folks, the bad folks, they have inspired you to make this product. They've inspired you to do the service. They've inspired you to go above and beyond and do something. And it's okay if not everybody likes your idea, right? It's okay if not everybody agrees with you because your uh, originality is going to be um, much more valuable in the long term than trying to do something that other people are kind of doing already. Be yourself. The challenge with truly innovative and original is that the finance people will, there, there's, a, there's a direct correlation. The more original and innovative it is, the less they'll understand it. This is where you're pitching and your ability to sell your idea, not on a technical enge engineering level, but on a how this is going to change the world level. That is so important. You have to have that. You have to have that passion. You have to really convince people at a high level why this is the best idea since sliced bread. So benefits. This is where we were talking about fringe. Um, it. Out of the gate, you don't necessarily have to have policies. It's going to be small. You can trust people. At some point, you'll want to figure out what are your standard policies and understanding around holidays, vacation, hiring, and firing. Um, timekeeping is less important in product. It's definitely important in a services company. Um, that is your, your lifeblood to being able to capture, again, an hour of effort. It's being able to prove that your timekeeping is accurate. Um, health insurance, um, 401k. Uh, 401ks, um, you also want to consider what kind of match do you want to make and how do employees make matches against that? Um, there are um, ways to cheat out of the box. That is the professional employment organization. So you basically join, uh, join a large company and you are your company is like a set of employees in that company, but you get the scale of the benefits. Um, I personally have never done this. Uh, it has been pitched to me over eight years and has not made sense, but I do want to highlight it as an option where they will do all of this out of the box for you. So I have actually done this twice and I, I really enjoy it because when you're super small and you only have five people or four people, being able to rely on somebody entirely to just handle all of that um, is huge. Um when you try to do that stuff by yourself, you know, when you have a couple of people, it's okay. But as soon as you start getting past, you know, 10 people, then it becomes complicated. Then the paperwork becomes a little bit hectic. And I personally would rather focus on the vision and the strategy and, you know, the selling and all of that fun stuff um, than, than the day-to-day -day management of that. So I personally like the PEOs, but again, it depends on what you're doing, how many people you have, what kind of time you want to spend on it. Do you have a particular PEO you want to recommend? I have used Next Step uh, with great success. So I would definitely check that out. They do all sizes of businesses from small to extremely large. So lots of different options. And on top of that, part of the benefit of being part of a PEO is because they're such a large organization, you get the benefit of discounting that you would not get when you try to go to these companies yourself. So when you're talking about the 401k, when you're talking about the health insurance, you're getting really amazing discounts based on not only the number of uh, folks that you have, but what type of business you are, what type of um, industry that you're in. And that can prove to be very valuable, especially if you're one of those um, you know, disadvantaged companies. Um, if you are uh, one of those minority companies, that can be very helpful for you. Back office. So we're going to run through this quickly uh, so we can get to Q&A. Um, contracts. Um, when you're small, people don't necessarily expect you to have them. Recommend that other people send you the contract. And this ties into legal. Um, have a lawyer who can help you review that unless you're comfortable with terms and conditions. Um, human resources is not something you don't have, you usually have to worry about until you're later. This is going to be more about the um, policy so that everybody feels treated fairly. 
Um, payroll, uh, payroll is complicated. That's something you're going to want to contract out. Uh, I have a recommendation at the end. Um, the PEO that Keenan mentioned will take care of that for you. Uh, accounting is critical to your business because that is your system of record of financially everything that happens. Um, the first time you get an IRS audit, you will be very glad that you didn't do your own accounting. Um, and then my final cheat here is when you get that first contract, you are going to most likely be required to have business insurance. Business insurance is anything from like errors and emissions, um, general liability. Uh, don't worry about it. Win the contract agree to the terms and conditions, you can get whatever the required insurance is that's dictated in that contract within a couple of days before you have to actually execute the work. So, and you can do this in negotiation. So of course my point is, I'm not a lawyer, we're not lawyers, keep this legal. That's not something you have to worry about till the end. The actual office, remember when that was a thing, there's different forms of offices to keep track of. Um, Another pearl of wisdom from another one of my favorite people on the planet, uh, Tanya Jenka. Don't give up and try and measure and fail and try again. This is so important. It, everything's not going to be roses and sunshine. Uh, things are going to break. People are going to quit. Uh, customers are going to fall out. And you just have to keep doing it. Don't give up. Keep keep driving because this is your passion, right? This is what you can't you can't live without doing this job. So so don't quit. Intellectual property, patents, obviously, you've heard of. Patents are formalizing particular um, uh, ideas. Other examples of that are trade secrets, where something is your proprietary way of doing something, but you don't have to formally identify it to the government. And then trademarks and copyright have to come down to um, images or particular text. Um, technically, once you put something in um, out, uh, I believe copyright stands. Again, we're not lawyers. Talk to an actual lawyer. They're usually not this good looking. Um, Everything yeah. else. Everything else. All the things that you think you know about, but you don't, like marketing and sales and channels and IT and the CISO and engineers. In the beginning, you will have two people, maybe three, or sometimes just yourself. And you are literally going to do all of these functions. And maybe after a little bit, you have five employees or 10 employees. And then those 10 employees will do everything. It is not until you have reached product market fit, that's PMF, product market fit, where you know your niche and you're selling into it, that the people that you're hiring are now doing possibly a one person to one role ratio. Before that, everybody that you hire, you better have that conversation that says, look, I know you're an engineer, but you're also a sales engineer and a marketer and our, our favorite you know, uh, talk show host and all of these things, because that's what everybody has to be. And you have to find the people that are willing to do that. Um, so we're actually out of time for here. So um, to close out, you'll face a random existential crisis that no amount of planning can prepare you for. You will get past it. You will survive. And at some point, they stop happening. And you're not alone. You have me and Keenan for references to reach out to. We're happy to help all of the entrepreneurs that we call out here. And like I said, when we share the slideshow, we have an entire back deck of additional resources and entrepreneurs. Um, this is from this is my quote. Becoming an entrepreneur is like joining an exclusive club where the only requirement is the desire to join. Every member will, should help you. Additional resources and we are going to go to Q&A. All right, Keenan Bryson, thank you so much for the pearls of wisdom, the sage advice. Um, we've got a set of about five questions here that we can hopefully run through. Uh, the first two seem to be mostly about funding. So Adrian asks, uh, what about things like the Founders Institute type of funding? Just wondering if you have any opinions on that. So Bryson's not saying anything, so I'm going to say yes. Um, I, I actually have had a, a great success dealing with those kind of mentor funds. Um, and I think that they're very useful in helping you to navigate some of the other equity options that are out there. Uh, something that's great about these kinds of institutes is that they know 
other companies that are going to be the right companies for your fit, and they will help reach out to them for you. So if you're looking to reach a lot of people, a lot of different types of investors all at once, I think that's a good option. Um, but definitely make sure that uh, going back to the earlier comments, that it's within the right kind of fit for you. So do some reach, uh, research, go to Crunchbase, uh, figure out who they are, what they normally invest in, what companies they invest in and go from there. All right, and Jim asks, do the presenters have any experience working with S-C-O-R-E or SCORE? I do not. No. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Jim, if you wanna clarify that in chat, we can ask it again. Uh, Emily asks, is it worth getting in involved with a toxic investor if you really need the seed money? If so, how do you make that decision? Never. Ever, never. So um, the Keenan Keenan touched on it, and the original slide I, I actually showed um, an unhappy married couple because that's what you're getting yourself into. You were literally jumping into a marriage where you will not be happy, and getting out of it is costly. I mean, it is costly in terms of money and emotional energy. You do not want to go to work with somebody you don't respect, you don't like, that doesn't share your values. Absolutely. Totally agree. And it's hard. It, uh, Keenan said many, many times, it is really hard to say no to the money. It's really hard. But keep looking because the right, the right people are out there and it might take a while to find them. It might take a while to find your people, but it's so, so worth it compared to that toxic relationship. And uh, similar on a similar vein, Tracy asks, what are the warning signs of a potentially awful partnership? <laughs> uh, well, I would say that this is part of one, um, Alyssa's slide about talking about vision. Um, I would say the other elements are, I mean, of course, this is why you wanna have those conversations that go beyond just that vision and really understanding who that person is and what their value system is. Absolutely. I think another part of it is um, you will see, it, in my experience, you will see almost immediately the people who are going to try to shape you and mold you and your company into something that it's not. Um, I've had a lot of experience with that in the last couple of months where um, they see what we're doing and they try to, you know, add a level of, um, you know, I hate to say money grabbing, but money grabbing that can go into it. Well, this is a, a much faster market. If you just drop it here, people will buy it and and you have to go, nope, nope, go back to Alyssa's uh, comments. You need to figure out what your vision is and not take the money. So when you feel like you're getting that strain um, and you're getting that pushback about what your ideas are and what the vision is, and it's um, it's not going quite the way it should, then don't do it. It's just like any other relationship, whether it's a friendship or other, you know kind of right away if you're gonna drive with this person or if you're not gonna drive. And if you don't have the warm fuzzy when you walk out of there, don't do it. Okay, uh, Duck asks, for a product, you've clearly set forth the point that the hook is not merely the idea that is for people and the execution. Nevertheless, the idea may be something which the founder perceives, sometimes correctly, to be very valuable and which could be acted upon somewhat readily by another competent team. The patent process is time consuming and expensive. NDAs notwithstanding, is there any realistic way to, around the need to lock in some patents before one goes out and starts pitching? So this is actually a great question. And I think that every entrepreneur should know when you're speaking to an investor, again, do your research. Who are they investing in currently? Who, uh, what kinds of companies? If you notice a potential conflict, if they're investing in literally your top five competitors, you probably don't want to talk to them. And if you do talk to them and they don't tell you upfront that they have a conflict of interest, then you walk away. So this is really important. This gets back to that integrity. This gets back to knowing the investors, knowing um, who's coming to the table. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. There's a certain agreement to talking with them, but um, I have only met one VC that I've ever found untrustworthy. Um, there have been certainly, I've been ghosted plenty of times and all sorts of other shady shenanigans, but only once have I ever felt like there was actually an integrity question. 
Um, all of the rest of them, uh, I mean, they don't, again, the idea is not the thing. And what you present in the pitch is not going to be the patentable part. Yep. You're going to be mostly showing the value proposition in a high level. If you're getting down to the technical details where somebody can replicate your patent, um, you're either talking directly to a nation state or you're <laughs> pitching very wrong. Yeah. High level, <laughs> really high level, more than an elevator pitch, but not technical at all. In fact, you should, yeah, there should be no technical conversations at all with investors. All right. So just me to asks, how long did it take for you to decide to pursue a startup from the seed of the idea to the first pen to paper? And why'd you make the jump? Um, so my first startup, um, one, I never thought I would be doing this. This is not, this was not like a, a thing. Um, uh, I guess I, I had somebody in the summer of 2012 tell me I should start my own company. Um, but I was like, ah, I don't want to do it if I don't have an idea. And then it was October of 2012 that I um, was flying on an airplane and I sketched something out on a cocktail napkin. And yes, I still have the cocktail napkin. And then it was January 2013 that I started that that first company. Um, the The idea for Scythe um, only came around when um, a very large retailer came to us with a particular challenge, and I I wasn't looking to do something else. And when they came to us with that, it like jogged my mind in a certain way because they had they had half the idea, and I was like, well, wait a second. If you're asking for this, that means all of these other things. I'm going to build that. And I went back and pitched to him and I said, I want the intellectual property. I have a different idea. I'm still going to meet your requirements, but I want to spend my own money to like try to do something with it. And they said, yes, they're like, all right, that sounds cool. And then they actually helped me develop the idea. Um, and that was probably the biggest thing that uh, struck me as a product vendor, because before I became a product vendor, I made fun of them like everybody else does. Oh, slimy product vendors. And then I realized that there are a lot of people out in the industry who are willing to help out innovative product vendors because they realize that that's the edge of what's possible in cybersecurity. And they really like are your friends. Like they're like, hey, look, we know what you've got isn't perfect. Like we know what you got probably is barely operational, but we believe in you and where this is going to go. We want to help now. This is the, the prototypical early adopter. We want to help now with giving you some money because we know if we can keep this idea along, we're really excited where it's going to be in two, three, five years. And that's really why you need to talk to other entrepreneurs also, especially in the InfoSec and the cyber community, is being able to identify those kinds of customers, those kinds of organizations who are willing to go and early and you know, seed this and feed it and watch it grow um, are immensely helpful. For me, my first startup um, was born out of frustration when I first got out of the military. Um, and um, the process by which they kind of kick you out and say, go get a job and have a life is not optimal. <laughs> um, so I really wanted to create a network of people that could help um, vets really get into really high quality jobs. Um, and at the time, there weren't a lot of people doing that. Um, so very shortly after I started doing it, there was another company that sprang up in the area, in the DC metro area, who was like, we just want to buy you guys. <laughs> like the way that you're doing this makes sense. Let's let's do that. So that was a very short lived thing, but it worked out very well. Um, with Spark, when you're talking about services, it's a little bit different, right? Um, it's all about what you know, and what you can teach and what, um, what you can provide in terms of educating people about a very specific topic. Um, so that's a little bit different. Uh, in the case of Shifted, I've been very fortunate um, to have a lot of people that kind of believed in me in a previous organization and really helped kind of push me in this direction. So it wasn't necessarily that I said, oh, my God, I have to do this. But I kept saying this would be a really, really great idea. And enough people said, you're right. That is a really good idea. You should do it. Um, and I was very lucky to have the support to make that happen. Okay, perfect. And this is our last question. I don't see any new questions in chat. So maybe we are our final one and more maybe a bit of more of an icebreaker. But uh, I was asking, do you have any tips for not acting like a tech bro? This is a question for both of you because one of you has had experience with tech bros and one of you 
he's a white dude, so. <laughs> I thought he was going to say, one of you is a tech pro. <laughs> I, that's what I thought was about to be said, too. And I was like, all right, come on. <laughs> come on, bro. Come yeah. on. Let's step outside. <laughs> uh, so how not to be a tech pro? Yeah. I mean, don't be a fucking douchebag. <laughs> No, I mean, so That's seriously, um, right? I, I think the biggest problem that I see in our industry and I see in our culture is empathy. Mm. We don't understand other people's experiences. And that's fair, right? It's you, you had your own set of experiences that has led you to a certain level of success or whatnot. And by no means is it possible for you to comprehend everybody else's experience. So recognize that you're not going to understand everybody else's experience. That doesn't mean that your intent or what you do or anything around that doesn't affect them differently than you can understand or that may, you know, it makes sense. So um, I, I personally just try to do the best that I can do about some very simple values of being good and, and pushing that out and doing things like this um, where give back to the community and, yeah, I'm not going to say I don't make mistakes and I'm not sometimes deaf to things that I don't know or don't understand. Um, I didn't necessarily come from a super privileged background, um, but I'm constantly trying to be open to understanding what else is out there because I really believe that security can only be solved by the diversity of the human experience, like by definition. And so the more we cut ourselves off to all of that difference, and any potential that could come from that. And it, it could be many different ways. It's not even just based on gender. Um, it can be based on different socioeconomic backgrounds. It can be based on, it can be based on race. It can be based on geography. All of those things absolutely are critical to understand what comes together. And there is value in that difference. That's, that's why, that's how I try to hold my standards to preventing from being a tech bro. And I, again, I'm not perfect, but I do the best that I can. So I think just to take that a step further, and that's a, honestly, that's a perfect answer. And that's what we all should be trying to do all the time. But I think also remembering that, you know, you may be the, an expert in what it is that you do, or um, you may be an expert in this particular kind of technology, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other people out there who are also experts who have a different perspective. And I think when we're talking about it, the tech bro in particular, again, not having the empathy, uh, like Bryson said, is super important. But part of that on a, on a deeper level is the inability to um, really recognize that they are not the smartest person in the room. So when you're thinking about that, when you're giving presentations, when you're, you're talking to other individuals, recognize that you're okay. <laughs> but you're a human being and you're not perfect and nobody is. And that's okay. Which is exactly why that diversity and inclusion is so absolutely critical. All right. Perfect. So that brings us full circle around and having empathy to Tracy Malief's keynote from this morning. So we're on good ground. Uh, Bryson Keenan, thank you very much for your talk, your excellent talk today, your excellent Q and a, um, and thank you to the audience for the excellent questions. Have a good evening folks. We'll be sharing the slides.